Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Zoo's first virtual learning academy experience. We are thrilled to be able to connect with you this morning and share with you some of what our animal friends have been up to back at the zoo. I did want to let you know a few housekeeping um, things before we get started here. So we're all learning how to use Zoom, right? <laughs> Myself included. Um, there is a chat box feature um, that you should be able to access when you're logged into Zoom. And that is the way that we are going to communicate with each other this morning. There are quite a few of you, but you should be able to drop your answers into the chat box um, as we are talking and I should be able to see them as well. So we'll be able to interact that way. Um, we can test that right now. If you wanna go ahead and just drop your name in the chat box, um, you can even tell us your favorite zoo animal if you want. And we'll kind of just give it a couple moments for everybody to get connected since this is all just our first um, time using Zoom here together. I am going to try to advance to the next screen here um, because there's one other thing we can do. Oh, hang on just a second here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to see if behind the scenes here, oh, here we go. My counterpart, Brandon, is working behind the scenes here. We are, again, like I said, still getting used to using this Zoom platform together. But if you've already introduced yourself in the chat box and you're still looking for something to do, it will be helpful if you can gather three materials. It's not a make or break situation. Just if you're um, tuning in with us, you may want to grab a sheet of paper it can be any kind of paper, scrap paper, construction paper, the back of a receipt, um, whatever works for you. And then maybe a writing utensil. You can see I pictured some markers up there, but again, it can be anything. I, get, I grabbed my child's crayons, so whatever works best for you. And then also if you have a stuffed animal, um, it kind of helps to visualize what we're picturing. I grabbed a cardinal because we are talking about backyard animals and detectives here this morning. So those three things will kind of help us learn together today. But if you don't have those or you don't have time, it's really not a big deal at all. Um, as people are continuing to join us and use that chat box feature, I am going to tell you a little bit about myself um, today, too. My name is Carrie Houck, and I am part of the Conservation, Education, and Engagement Department at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. So it's that first building you kind of see when you come through and you're looking at the lake there, that's our education building right off to the right hand side. Um, I normally am teaching in our zoo kids preschool classroom um, and hopefully some of my zoo kids are on here today getting a chance to watch as well. Um, I also help out with our little explorers base camp program. And so I'm kind of that early childhood um, instructor in our department. Now behind the scenes, you won't see him, but he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting with this program, is Brandon Good. He is also part of our education department here at the zoo. Um, you can see, oh, hell, hi, Eleanor's using the chat book. She says her favorite animal is an elephant. That's awesome. Um, you can kind of see I grew up loving animals. There's a picture of me on the screen as a little as a little girl and I'm still here at the zoo sharing all of those animals with you. So um, I think a lot of people have had the chance to get connected. So we'll just go ahead and move forward. Um, we are talking about our backyard today. But before we can talk about our backyard, kind of our special word for this program is the word habitat. Now let's see. Um, Oh, I did it again. Let's see here. You're back, Carrie. Okay, here we go. I wanted to tell you a little bit about our plan for the day as it relates to the word habitat. So first we're gonna figure out what is a habitat, right? What does that word mean? If you're an animal, what do you need from your habitat? We're gonna relate it to a puzzle. I bet a lot of you guys, since we're spending a lot of time at home, are using a puzzle right now too, maybe as a way to occupy your time. We will then take a look at our own backyards, think about how we're making um, some decisions regarding animals and being able to visit our backyard. And then we're gonna share one of my favorite stories that I use a lot in my own classroom. And then we'll finish out the program um, with giving you a few ideas to think about while you're spending a lot of time at your house on ways that you can get more wildlife to visit your backyard. So thank you again for tuning in and for being patient with us as we work out some of our little technical glitches here. But 
if you have an idea of what a habitat means, you can drop that in the chat box right now. I put up a picture of one of our favorite spots at the zoo, Habitat Hollow, to get your brain thinking here, right? It's a nice little warm up. Um, I'm sure lots of you guys have visited Habitat Hollow before. So as you're thinking about habitat, oh great, Andre is saying it's an animal's home. That's exactly right. You guys are smart today. Um, it's, it is an animal's home, but of course we know, and Eleanor knows it's where animals live. Perfect, you guys are right on the right track. Um, there are three different habitats represented in Habitat Hollow, right? If you walk in through the door, you're gonna walk through a wetland habitat. Um, then you're gonna go and move through a forest habitat. It's where that great big tree is that's hollowed out. And you'll finish in our prairie habitat, which is where those dry, taller grasses are growing. And then the final room in the house is, is our habitat, right? Our kitchen area. Um, you guys, everybody's getting it. Jordan is saying a place where animals live. Spot on, you guys, great job. So we have so many different habitats because not every animal is the same. They all need different things, right? So I want you to kind of think about what do animals need as we look at another habitat in North America. I have to say it's one of my favorites. It's the North America aviary. So as we take a look and connect back to the zoo and the aviary, kind of use your thinking cap this morning to see if you can figure out what makes it a good habitat? What has our planning department at the zoo had to think about when they were creating that habitat? What is our animal care staff thinking about as they're moving through the habitat? And of course, why do the birds really like it there? So I'm gonna take you over there to the aviary. You guys will be seeing, oh, Savvy's favorite animal is a stingray, nice. You guys are gonna be seeing a lot of different birds. I'll do my best. Bird watching is one of my favorite hobbies, especially now that I'm here at home a lot to identify these birds for you. What you're looking at right now, that bright orange bird was an oriole. And this is a, a girl oriole here. And pay attention to what she's doing. That's very important to a habitat. Here's an American robin. Um, I see those quite a bit in my backyard, especially right now that the weather has warmed up. I see them hopping around in my backyard. This one happens to be sitting in a tree. <laughs> there are a couple of bluebirds in the North America aviary. And what we'll see with a lot of bird species is um, the male is a little bit brighter and bolder in color. Um, his fe feathers are more vibrant and the females are a little bit more um, kind of drab or subdued. The colors just aren't as bright. Here's the female Oriole splashing around. Pay attention to what she was doing and what she was doing it in, that's important. This is one that tricks a lot of people because it's a blue bird, but it's actually called an indigo bunting. And again, pay attention to kind of where these birds are at in the aviary. What are they doing? What are they using in their habitat? I hope you guys are seeing the morning dove right now. Oh, Silas gets American Robins in his backyard. That's amazing, Silas, great. I see a lot of morning doves in my backyard too. They tend to hang out on the ground underneath the feeders. Um, they're kind of opportunistic, I think. They'll eat kind of what falls to the ground there. Um, this is one of my favorite birds too, the red-winged blackbird. You can't hear his call right now, but it's kind of one of the first signs of spring here in Ohio is when we hear those red-winged blackbirds calling um, from some of our roadside kind of um, wetland areas. This one I think would be harder to get at your backyard bird feeder, but never say never, right? It's a rose-breasted grosbeak. And pay attention to what's in its beak right now. It's called a rose-breasted grosbeak because it does have that patch of kind of like reddish scarlet feathers. Um, this one that you're looking at is a cedar wax wing. All right, lots of people are getting great backyard birds, blue jays, robins. You guys, I love to hear that. That means your backyards are a great place for wildlife. They probably look a lot like our aviary. Here is some other birds, what are they doing right now? Hmm, think about that. We'll talk about that here in just a moment. Ooh, somebody, Tracy has a woodpecker in her backyard. That's amazing. And a friendly cardinal, Sarah says. I love that. 
right now is a great time of year to see birds in your backyard. Not only are we spending a lot more time at home, right, but the weather is warming up. A lot of birds are going to start migrating through here the first week of May. Um, we have a lot of our spring, spring warblers coming through. And so overall, you'll probably just hear a whole lot more bird and see more bird activity. This is one of my favorite ones. This is a chickadee right here. Um, it's called a black capped chickadee. They're very cute and small. I love to see those at my feeder. All right, I think we're going to advance here. Um, it sounds like you guys had a lot of great answers. So I wanna hear what makes a good habitat. I put some pictures up there to kind of get your brain thinking about it, but I'm sure that you guys um, have a lot of good answers too. What did you see the birds using in the aviary that makes it a nice spot for them? It can be something that our animal care staff puts in or just something that's growing there on its own. Use the chat box right now. You can tell us some of your answers. You might need your big person, whoever's at home with you today. Yes, Mike says trees, exactly. I hope you guys saw a lot of trees in the aviary. Silas says water, perfect. Cecilia is also saying water. Um, the trees provide a lot of shelter, of course, for the birds, a nice spot for them to hop around in um, and feel protected. This time of year, they are looking to make a nest as well um, to keep their babies safe, their eggs safe, um, and then, of course, a safe spot so they don't um, get eaten by predators. Lots of you guys, Stan is saying food. I hope you noticed it wasn't just one kind of food in the aviary, right? There are lots of different birds living there. So our animal care staff just does such a wonderful job of preparing their diets every day. We don't eat the same thing every day, right? Mom or dad or our big person helps us kind of figure out what we wanna have for breakfast, lunch, dinner. And that's kind of what our animal care staff does too. They think, okay, if I'm a bird with a small beak, I might need a small seed to crack. If you're a bird like an Oriole, you're looking for oranges and citrusy foods to eat. If you're a bird like a bluebird or a robin, you eat a lot more worms. So they're gonna fill those dishes with mealworms for those birds. So every time you see a food spot in the aviary, that's a spot where our animal care staff and our animal nutrition department has really thought about what those birds need to eat to kind of mimic what they would be eating in the wild. You guys also noticed water, perfect. A lot of um, birds were splashing around in the water. Um, so we have food, that's a super, super important one for our habitat. We have water, of course, right? Just like you need to drink water, they do too. We have the trees, we call that shelter. Um, and lots of the birds you're mentioning in the comments, Silas said shelter, perfect. They need all of these things, right? To have a great habitat. But the very last thing, and this one is harder um, to have a picture up there, but I put a picture of a cardinal. And of course I have my cardinal stuffed animal. Now's a great time to pull out your stuffed animal if you had a chance to grab one. And think about, if you have one or two stuffed animals, that's even better. Um, think about them in terms of being real live animals. Real live animals don't like to be super, super close to each other. You would never find a cardinal and a woodpecker kind of side by side like this in a tree, right? They need space. They need space to fly around and build their nest. And they don't want to compete with other birds for food, right? They don't want to have to um, share their food, water, shelter with anybody. So they need space. So whatever the habitat is, your backyard or otherwise, they have to have room to move around. And so, like I said, that's hard to represent, but hopefully you got the feeling from visiting our aviary this morning that there's plenty of space in there for all the birds. They are not in competition for any of those resources. So now that we've taught about animals and those four habitat needs, let's think about us, right? We're part of this too. So your house there, we're gonna pretend that that red house with the blue shingles and the chimney is you for a second. What about you? Do you need those same four things? Drop in the chat box, what do you think? Do you need food, water, shelter, space? And while you're thinking about that, I'll answer a question here. It said, how or um, why do birds migrate or hibernate? So a bird um, kind of inherently knows when the weather starts to turn. Um, if they're going to have enough of those resources to stay here in Ohio over the winter or they're going to have to migrate and they'll know that just instinctually, right? So some of our spring, spring migrants, those are those warblers um, that are coming through right now, are not able 
to stay here in the winter. But our cardinals, our blue jays, sometimes our robins, those guys are able to stay and that's why you'll see them more at your feeder. So yes, Becky, Shirley, everybody has noticed that you also need those four things, right? So you need food. I have a picture there of a refrigerator. Mom or dad might help you um, get a snack from, from time to time, open up the pantry. You need food. Um, you need a shelter. That looks a little bit different for everybody, right? Maybe um, your shelter is your whole bedroom, or maybe you're sharing your bedroom with a sibling or someone, and you each have your own bed as your shelter. It's the kind of that spot where you go to get cozy and protected at nighttime, right? Or just if you want some alone time, you might go back to your shelter. So that's why I have a picture of a bed there. I have another picture, hopefully you can see it right next to the house, and we call this room in my family the family room, kind of that room where everybody goes to play with toys or work a puzzle, maybe watch a show, but you can see there's a couch. Everybody needs a little bit of space, right? We don't want to be right on top of our family members. So that's kind of the nice part about wherever you're at. Your shelter very likely has plenty of room for all of your family members. Now, there is a picture of a backyard here on this screen. And I put this up here because that's kind of the intersection where we and animals actually both use. We're both in the backyard, right? So we might go out there to grill or to have a picnic or play, um, toss a ball. But to an animal, that could be their home. And I wanted to show you one of those animals back at the zoo. He's making his debut today um, that also could live in your backyard. So while you're playing, he might be um, sleeping up in a tree, you never know. So here's a picture of him first. He is a screech owl. And the screech owl that we're gonna see today, his name is Otis. And he, like I said, is making his debut. He's, um, I have not seen him being used in any other animal programs recently. So you guys are getting kind of an up close peek at him. Let's see what he's up to. So here again is a great example of our animal care staff doing a wonderful job sort of mimicking what a screech owl would be doing in the wild at the zoo. So screech owls need to perch a lot, right? They are sleepy, sleepy little owls during the daytime. So they'll sit right up there in a tree. That's why I said you may not even know they're in your backyard. And they have those beautiful feathers that help them camouflage. Um, a lot of you guys are mentioning you've seen a screech owl before. That's amazing um, because they are kind of small. They're a smaller owl that we have here in Ohio um, and we don't see them a lot during the day. So you'd have to be having a backyard camp out maybe <laughs> to see him. So someone wants to know why they sleep during the day. Noah wants to know and stay up at night. That's a great question, Noah. Like I said, he's a smaller owl and owls just in their makeup are more um, equipped to hunt at nighttime. He's got those great big eyes that you're seeing right now. He is nocturnal. So his eyes let in tons of um, moonlight at nighttime to help him hunt. But also, um, he's a smaller owl. So for him to be out during the day would might, might be detrimental to him just because there are bigger birds even that could eat him. So he knows, um, I'll just kind of huddle up next to a tree trunk and I will kind of make myself almost impossible to see. And then at nighttime, I'll wake up and I'll hunt for animals in your backyard. Friends were wanting to know what they eat. Noah wants to know what they eat. Um, he can hear with actually some little slits on the side of his face. You don't see them. They don't have stick out ears like we do. Um, but the sound goes into those ear holes and help him to hear um, a mice that's on the ground in your, in your backyard, right? So then he'll fly over. They fly silently, believe it or not. I always find that so interesting. You won't hear him flying in your backyard and he'll grab um, his prey with uh, his talons. Hopefully you guys got to see them. Um, he does look fake. It's because, <laughs> Alice says he looks fake. It's because he is awake during the day for you guys right now, right? Um, so we woke him up to make his debut with, with you all today. Um, you may have also noticed, I also like to point this out, that he is wearing what we call a Jess, and that is just so that he can continue to um, 
be an ambassador animal for the zoo. So not only is he going to meet you guys today, but eventually he'll go out and travel with um, some of our other animal care staff to schools or to senior living centers, and they have to be able to carry him safely, right? So the Jess is that little kind of ankle bracelet there attached to that um, lead rope so that his animal handler can safely have him perch on her arm. And I always like to point that out because of course in your backyard you wouldn't see that but you guys are exactly right you, you guys all have some great observations he is going to just to sum it up he's going to sleep a lot during the day he's going to come out at night to hunt for food in your backyard so he's come to your backyard and we're going to see a puzzle here in just a second on the screen you can see we have those four words food water shelter space that's why he's in your backyard they all work together and fit together like a puzzle piece. And this is the dream, right? When all four of those things come together, the animal is really loving its habitat. It's, it's happy there, right? But I want you to think for a second, because I have to tell you, this recently happened to me. I was working a puzzle at home, I got the whole thing done, and I was missing one piece. And it was a super frustrating feeling, right? So imagine that for a moment, in, in an animal's life. It's missing a super important part of the puzzle. What's it gonna do in its habitat? Is it gonna be able to stay there? Drop what you think in the chat box. We'll see what a few guys, of you guys are saying. Let's just say for today that it's missing its food source. Um, for whatever reason, somebody set out some mouse traps and there's no more mice in your backyard. What's gonna happen? Amina says, no, they're not gonna be able to live there. Let's see what some other people say. She says it will leave. <laughs> Elizabeth is also saying no. <laughs> it might have to find a different source of food, Deborah is saying, or it might die. Um, Camden says, nope, it's not going to be able to live there. You guys are exactly right. I knew this was going to be a good group of detectives and you've proven me right here. It cannot stay in a habitat where there is no food, right? Um, or let's say there was plenty of mice, but you put a great big shed <laughs> that covered your whole backyard and there was no more space because now it has to go somewhere else and compete with another animal. So the animal has a couple of options when that happens, right? So it can try to find a different source of food, water, shelter, or space. It can try to move to another area and very often that does happen. Um, Eleanor say it's gonna leave, yep, because it's gonna have to find another food source. Um, but a lot of times, um, there's so few resources that sometimes we do see um, animals disappearing from the wild in our backyard. So that's why we want to work together. That's why this program is so important because you guys are going to continue to make your backyards a great spot for wildlife. So now we're going to transition to another little activity here where I want you to close your eyes for a second and think about a spot. If, if there's not a backyard at your house, that's okay. Just think about a spot where um, you've played before maybe, that's like a park or a green space. Um, what does your backyard look like? If you've thought of something that you have in your backyard that maybe animals would like, you can drop it in the chat box. Let's see what our backyard, I'll tell you a little bit about my backyard. In the spirit of this program, I added a new bird feeder. I have to say, I think the birds are a little confused. No, no one seems to be interested in my new bird feeder right now, but I think it's just been really windy lately and the birds are kind of hunkered down. <laughs> um, Paige has some trees, that's awesome. We know that trees are a great shelter for animal. Eleanor has trees and bushes, perfect. A birdhouse somebody mentioned, a walnut tree. You guys have great backyards for wildlife. We, oh. Savvy has a bird feeder, perfect. A big tree and insects, I love that because the insects are looking for a habitat, but they might be food for somebody else, right? So it sounds like your backyards are, are already a great spot, which is perfect news because this next animal visitor doesn't need a lot from your backyard, right? It's, we're gonna see here, we're gonna connect back with the zoo to see a black rat snake. I show you this picture first because this is a very up close view. And you can really see um, those scales on the snake's body, on the top and the bottom, even all up over its face. And it's sticking its tongue out. So think about what um, a snake might need to do that for. Let's see what our black rat snake is up to at the zoo. 
All right, so again, I just need to give a shout out. Our wonderful animal care staff has made this enrichment, right? So um, lots of animals need enrichment here at the zoo, especially our snakes. Um, and snakes are excellent climbers. So they made this enrichment board. You can see it has a lot of um, wooden uh, stumps kind of coming out of it because a snake needs to climb a lot. Even though it doesn't have any arms or legs like you, they're excellent climbers. And that's probably what they're doing in your backyard if you have a tree. Um, they might also be um, smelling around for food. Um, Noah is saying it can smell with its tongue. You guys are exactly right. We saw that earlier. Um, it is going to stick its tongue out in your backyard, kind of sample the air around it, pull its tongue back in, and it, that will kind of send a message to its brain. It has a special organ there at the back of its throat um, called a Jacobson's organ where that helps it identify the smells that it's seeing. And you're right, Tracy, some snakes also can see body heat. That's important to them too. Um, but I, uh, they are gonna smell. They have to smell the mice or whatever food source you might have in your backyard, right? So um, our animal care staff there was just giving it a chance to exercise um, and it would do that in your backyard. It would spread out maybe over a warm rock or a, a warm tree branch and just soak up the sun in your backyard. And snakes actually don't need a lot from your backyard habitat um, in comparison, I'll say to other animals. So here's where we're gonna do a little activity. Um, if you missed us before, we just said to grab any old scrap of paper, no need to get fancy here this morning. Um, and if you have a writing utensil of any kind, that will work for this exercise. So go ahead and do that right now. And I wanna hear from you guys. I kind of threw up this picture of a sort of blank backyard. It needs our help. Maybe your backyard needs our help, right? So think about for a second, you can draw if you're feeling um, creative this morning or if you're an older participant and you're really good at writing, you can just write a word. But I wanna hear what could you add to your backyard to make it a better spot for wildlife? It could be something super, super simple. It could be something maybe that's a bigger project. You know, we have a little bit more time at home. Maybe you wanna take on something even bigger, like creating a pond. So let's hear some of your answers there um, once you're done. And I'll give you a few minutes. I know we're all working um, and writing, and that's awesome. So like I said, if you are catching up with us here, we're just grabbing a scrap piece of paper. We are using any sort of writing utensil. Ooh, lots of flowers, Amina said. Jude would like to add a waterfall. Jude, that is on my list as well. Eleanor says more trees and bushes, maybe flowers for the bees. Perfect. A small pond. I love that you guys want to add a small pond because like I said, a pond or a waterfall, that's, that's on my list too. Silas says flowers for pollinators. Perfect. Hopefully we'll be able to get back um, into our local nurseries and places soon to get some, some planting going. Ooh, Paige says birdhouses. Hadley says trees and flowers. Sean's gonna dig a little bit. <laughs> Alice says a lot of stuff. Perfect. Great. Okay. Well, let me share some of the things that I was thinking about too. Ooh, Alora says she already has a pond. Love to hear that. Okay. Here's what I was thinking. See, see if you match any of my answers. Here's, here's our blank backyard. I was thinking, as you guys mentioned, a waterfall or a pond of some sort because I have a son at home who would love to see some frogs or tadpoles in his backyard. So if we have some time, we're going to do that. I was also thinking I want to see all the birds, right? A couple of you guys mentioned bird feeders. And here's the cool thing about bird feeders. There's so many different kinds because all of those different birds eat different types of foods. You can see the goldfinch and the chickadee um, are eating out of this thistle feeder. You might have house finches or cardinals or robins. You might want to scatter some food on the ground, but find maybe a new bird feeder. Carson says, my dad has a pond like that. That's awesome, Carson. I also would really love to get a bird bath. I'm going to have to do a little bit more research on this um, because I know there's a couple of options, but I was thinking I'll start um, <laughs> with a basic model here. And then finally, a lot of you guys mentioned this, which made me so happy. You're going to plant flowers. Now here's my, my uh, words of wisdom right now with the flowers. Always, always research with your big person at home the native flowers to Ohio. So cone flowers like the ones pictured, or I always like to give a shout out 
to milkweed because I bet a lot of you guys know this, but there are um, monarch butterflies that come through Ohio and need milkweed um, to eat, but also to lay their eggs on. So um, there are different milkweed collecting um, places that you can get seeds from and local nurseries that have those. So it sounds like you guys and I were on the same page here, right? Um, so we're all gonna make some additions to our backyard. And once we do, you might see one of these next animals. Again, I'm noticing a pattern here. <laughs> um, a lot of our backyard animals, our mammals, are, seem to be nocturnal here. And that's um, the same. Um, and Thomas, that is A-OK. -okay. Um, if you are just here for the animal clips, that is fine. Um, just continue to watch with us. We'd love to have you. <laughs> um, here is an opossum. This is a picture right now. We're going to connect back with the zoo here in a moment and see what our opossums are up to. All right, if you have ever been to our education building, we have that glass kind of um, window into the building where the animal care staff rotates some of the animals that are out for everybody to see. Um, it seems that there is a rotation between the possums and um, our very last animal visitor, so I don't wanna spoil that for you yet, but here again, our opossum is looking for food and our animal care staff isn't just gonna put it right out there for them. We want them to do what they would do in your backyard, which is use their nose. Their eyes are not very big. <laughs> oh, Jenny had a possum in her backyard playing dead. That's awesome. Um, probably scared you a little bit too, but they're gonna use their nose. Here you go. You can see she's found some mealworms. Possums are what they call opportunistic feeders also, which means they're not too particular about what they eat. So he's getting some mealworms right now, um, but they might get a meatball later on. I know they get dog food, which is kind of silly, but actually dog food is made so it has lots of um, the vitamins and minerals that even our animals at the zoo need. So um, the animal care staff hides some of it so that they have to kind of um, be active as they're looking for it, use all of those same senses that they would use in the wild. When she gets thirsty, you can see we've put some water in her habitat. And you might be wondering, what does playing dead mean for an opossum? So let me tell you really quickly, when they start to get a little bit scared or nervous, maybe they've noticed a bigger predator in your backyard, they're gonna roll over, <laughs> their heart rate is gonna slow down quite a bit. It's just gonna be like barely beating. And they even start to smell a little bit. <laughs> they wanna give off the impression that they're dead, right? So that the predator leaves them alone. Um, and probably so that you would leave them alone if you were getting too close. Um, and once that predator has passed on by or they know that, that they are safe again, they will roll back over, they'll be totally fine and they will carry on about their evening. <laughs> So let, I hope that you make and are thinking about making um, lots of improvements to your backyard so you, you can see possums, you can see reptiles, amphibians, all of that good stuff. We're going to zoom in on its tail for you. Um, this is always a surprising part of the opossum. It doesn't have any hair on its tail. <laughs> um, and that is simply, I think, because they're dragging it on the ground behind them so much and maybe even through some yucky food stuff that they eat um, that they don't end up having any hair on their tail. But their tail is also what we call prehensile, which just means that it is helping them balance or um, helping them almost like an extra leg or arm would. And so because they also spend a lot of time in trees during the day, um, they uh, need to balance as they're climbing up there. So they'll, they can even carry stuff in their tail. They might carry a little bit of ripped up newspaper. Chloe wants to know um, what its name is. And our possums, if your big person at home has ever watched the show Parks and Rec, our possums are named after some characters on Parks and Rec. I believe, I believe it's Frank, Frankie and Leslie. Um, so, I don't know how to tell them apart. <laughs> You'll have to come back to the zoo and help me with that. <laughs> but good question. And then somebody also pointed out that they are marsupials. That's exactly right. They're actually our only marsupial in North America, which 
Um, marsupial is a fancy word for having a pouch on their tummy. Um, and I didn't want to get into that too much, but that actually is where they carry their babies. So if you have a really great backyard for possums, eventually you might see a mama possum out there with with her babies. They actually crawl out of the pouch eventually and kind of hold on to their back. They kind of have that scruffy gray fur there. So keep your eyes out, especially in those dusk or evening hours. Now you'll see on the screen, we are gonna use a book. Um, it's kind of difficult to share a book over Zoom, but this one is not to be missed. It is called On Meadowview Street here. And I like to use this in my classroom because it tells the story of exactly what you guys are thinking about right now. The little girl in the book, her name is Caroline, and her and her family have just moved to Meadowview Street. And they're wondering, is there actually a meadow, right? Um, and so she's about to explore her street when she sees a flower that um, she really, really likes. But she's also noticing that her dad is about to start cutting the grass. So she says, wait, 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 wait. I want to protect my flower. So that's what she's done here on the cover. And you can see on this next page, it's an up close picture of that. Um, and you guys are right. I love that you are supporting each other in the chats there. I saw a question come across. What do possums eat? So they are um, opportunistic, which means just they'll eat just about anything. They have the most teeth of any mammal, so they can eat meat, but they also will eat um, plants of any kind. Um, they can eat bugs. And I'm so, so glad that someone pointed out that they eat ticks, which I know is kind of a yucky Thing to think about. Ticks are not always the most helpful animal to find in our backyard. They are um, a spider, I believe, um, that can cause some harm to humans. So we are so thankful that possums are out there eating those ticks for us. So that's another great reason to have them in your backyard. Maybe our, our star here, Caroline, also has one in her backyard. Um, but you can see she's about to protect the flower from her dad, who's mowing the lawn. And then her dad and her sort of start to work together because she notices a butterfly visit her flower, right? Um, and so eventually, I'm gonna hold this up here and behind the scenes here, Brandon is gonna zoom in on this so you can see, but eventually she um, convinces her dad that they should be protecting a lot more of their yard. So you can see the meadow grew from one flower to a whole big patch here, right? And then eventually, guess what? Her dad decides to sell the lawnmower. It's for sale because it's probably much easier for him not to mow the grass and to make it a great spot for wildlife. So they continue, Caroline and her dad, to think about all of um, the things that they can add to your backyard, just like you're doing today. And so she decides that she's going to add a pond, like so many of you. Um, we're zooming back into our PowerPoint. Just stay with us here for a second. When Brandon and I switch control, we um, have to be patient as the other one works it back to the right slide that we were on here. Um, so he's going to zoom through those slides for us. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patience, you guys. We really appreciate it. Um, but yes, uh, over the course of the book, she adds a pond, she adds a birdhouse, just like you guys are thinking about. She plants flowers, um, she adds another tree, and eventually um, she is the house that's the meadow, and she has seen lots and lots of animals in her backyard, which of course is what we want to happen for you guys too, right? We, we know your backyard detectives, so we want you to think about spend some time in your backyard, be like Caroline. Um, and if you need some more ideas here, um, we have those for you too here. Let's see. Yeah, here's some more ideas. Now, I haven't actually had a chance to plant anything yet in, in any pots on, um, on my deck, but I have this terracotta pot that I'm gonna turn into what we call a toad abode. And I'm gonna flip it over, right? And I'm gonna prop it up on some rocks. And terracotta is a material that holds water really well. So underneath here is gonna be a safe shelter for lots of amphibians, frogs and toads. So you can do that too if you have an empty terracotta pot. So we threw that suggestion up there. I always say to help mom or dad fill those bird feeders, especially if that's something you were gonna to add to your backyard. Maybe grab a suet feeder or a thistle feeder or some mealworms and then get your binoculars ready because the birds will come, right? They are hungry all the time and they need lots of energy. So they're looking for your bird feeders. And I always like to have my 
um, binoculars handy so that I can see them really well. And so I call that my backpack for backyards. And Silas is right. Woodpeckers love the suet that you put out. So if you have your binoculars, you can see them really well. You can look in a field guide to identify them. So it's always nice to have those materials kind of in one spot. So when you're ready to do some detecting in your backyard, you are good to go. Another one that I think is becoming really popular right now is an insect hotel. And that is the picture where it says designated wildlife area because there are lots of beneficial insects right in your backyard. And those are the ones you want to stay there all year and help you out. So if you put up an insect hotel, they will go inside those little holes you see, spend the winter in your backyard, and then when it's springtime, they'll be out and ready to help you like a ladybug, like Alora is saying. The ladybugs are a great beneficial insect. Um, and then I did mention this earlier, but research those native plants. Um, our bees, our butterflies would love it if you planted some of those in your backyard. Um, and we would love that for you too. So, and I think like I mentioned before, the cool thing about milkweed, um, it grows pretty aggressively once you plant it. Um, and so it will come back year after year. Um, it is a perennial and um, monarchs lay their eggs kind of in the same area every year. They instinctually know to travel back to that same milkweed patch. Kendall wants to know what frogs eat. In my experience, Kendall, frogs, if you have a pond in your backyard, are gonna eat lots of insects also. Um, they have a sticky tongue that helps them do that. The frogs in my classroom eat really, really tiny pinhead crickets. So keep that in mind. Um, another good reason to have lots of insects in your backyard if you wanna see a frog. Um, so once you decide to make all of these changes or additions even to your backyard, or do you know what? If you just simply want to spend some more time out there, that's a great thing to do too. Get comfortable in your backyard, look around, just be more aware of what's happening back there. I would encourage you to do that too. You might end up seeing our next and last animal visitor here. It is a skunk. So we have two skunks at the zoo. Um, I know someone's going to ask me their name and I do believe their names are Febreze and um, petal, but I could be wrong on the second one, but they're doing exactly <laughs> what that possum was doing, which is looking for food, right? Morning time at the zoo is, is when everybody's um, habitats are getting kind of cleaned up and the new food is coming out. But here again, it's so important to note that our animal care staff has probably hidden some of their food, maybe under the rocks or in the mulch, um, and so they have to find it. Um, and use their senses just like they would do in the wild. So somebody's asking, what do skunks eat? That's a great question. Skunks eat a lot of insects also. They'll eat grubs from your yard. Um, they don't have nearly as big of a mouth um, or sharp as teeth as a possum does. So they can't eat everything that possums do. I would say they would, they're sticking to a lot of insects. Um, maybe at the zoo, perhaps a little bit of dog food or, um, a liquid that kind of tastes like insects. But chances are you guys um, have mulch in your backyard too. So again, animals are gonna be back there digging around in your mulch also. I have some squirrels that are currently digging up um, my daffodil bulbs, but I don't mind because I know that they, they need to eat too. So um, somebody was asking, Silas asked, um, how do we plant milkweed? That's a great question, Silas. I found um, a couple of different types of milkweed at local nurseries here in Columbus. Um, I'm thinking of Oakland Nursery and a few others, but you can also collect milkweed seeds. The Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the zoo's partner, actually, the Wilds, has been collecting milkweed seeds because they produce a pod um, at the end of their growing season and it eventually splits open and these sort of wispy white looking cotton things come out and that's actually the seed. So there are people that are collecting them because we do need to plant a lot of milkweed. So I would suggest getting in touch with somebody at ODNR or even the wilds. Um, if you want to drop your email in the chat box, we will put you in touch with one of our educators at the wilds for sure. 
All right, you guys, I think that our connection there with the skunks has ended. Um, again, if you have any other um, concerns or information that you need, that is perfect for what the chat box is for. We are continuing to monitor that. We wanted to thank you so much for tuning in to our first virtual academy and um, giving us so much grace as we work through the technology piece from our homes in the zoo. We do plan to be back here next Thursday at 10 o'clock with a new topic and some new animals from the zoo. Also, um, we would love to see you here again. And if you're wondering any information about the zoo or Zumbezi um, and, and when we're opening, social media is where that information will be posted. Um, and that's a great place to also get more education clips and see what our keepers are up to. They've been doing such a great job um, filming some content as well. So um, again, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next Thursday. I, I look forward to hearing about your backyards. Have a wonderful day, you guys. Bye-bye.